thank you foremost above all else for the privilege and the opportunity to assemble one unto another, especially as we see the day approaching. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity and the privilege to touch one another in faith, to encourage, Lord God, to, to, to help each other in whatever way we can to enable us to press in. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that, Lord God, even when correction comes, Lord God, it's never with malice. It's always with love and direction. Let our correction, if need be, always, always be seen as instruction, Lord, that we may grow together and be raised up together to the headship of Christ Jesus. I ask, Lord God, that everyone here today, as they hear the logos, they receive the rhema within their own personal hearts and their own lives. Help me, Father God, as being an instrument of your voice to sow seed with every and in every heart that is ready to receive that seed. And Lord, I thank you, Father God, that everyone here has examined and is examining their heart to see where there's fallow ground in their lives. And Lord God, where that fallow ground is, let them put their hand to the plow, turn it up so that seed may bring a great harvest in their lives and the people around them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. No limitations to God's power in us when we serve Him. That's the name of the message today. No limitations to God's power in us when we serve Him. Our text reading will be found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. And our key te text verse is verse 10. But I've given you that, I'm giving you that now, but I also want to, to tie it into something. And it's something that I, I don't believe that many theologians, and I'm not saying that, that I'm an expert at anything, I'm just saying I don't see, even in commentaries or listening to other people through the years, where they see the book of Acts as anything other than a past tense book of something that the apostles and the disciples did, but it's a finished thing. And I've told you that before. I believe that we're coming to the end of the second day, fixing to go into the third day of Acts, if you will. But the point I want to make today, Brother Kev, is this. I don't see the book of Acts as just a book of action nor do I relate it to a revival, because it's not a revival. It's the birth of the church, so it's not a revival. It's the birth of the church. And I don't see it as recordings of just the disciples and the first, and the apostles and the first believers. I see it where it is what it's meant to be, the introduction, Sister Cindy Lou, of the power of the promise of God through Jesus Christ. He spoke that promise. He said, go and tarry in Jerusalem until the promise come to you, till you be endued with power. So we know that the book of Acts is more about the Holy Spirit fulfilling the word that Jesus said. He would empower the people that he, that he gave a commission to, to do something. So we know that the book of Acts is not just about tongues, and it's not just about this, it's not, and it's not about, and people say, well, pastor, you got it wrong. It's, it's really about <clears throat> evangelism. No, all those thought, things, just like I told you this morning before service, all those things are part of the whole, but they're not the whole. That's why I say we are in Acts. But what I want to, to share with you today is something that I want you to at least think about. The Holy Spirit, Sister Victor, came upon the body of Christ, came upon the church to birth it forth in power because it had no power outside of Christ. When Jesus Christ was here, all the apostles and the disciples were underneath his authority here on earth, his physical authority. When he left, the Holy Spirit came. He said there'll be another helper to come, right? 
So we know that the Holy Spirit came to empower the whole body to do and work and operate in the authority of Jesus Christ. Is that not correct? Him being at the right hand of the Father. Holy Spirit being here to work with us. But if it was a birthing forth of a supernatural power to the body of Christ, what else do you see that happened? <coughs> I want you to step back from the trees, so to speak, so you can see the forest, and look. It's about power, right, that came to the church. But what else was released that you didn't see before in more of an intense measure? Huh? I'm going in a different direction here, brother. The counterpart, there's always a counterpart to whatever God does. Yes, and the opposition that came against the body of Christ was supernatural. It was an influencer of the people. It was supernatural. So you have an influencer of darkness filled with the counterfeit power of Satan. How many of you know that Satan is still the God of this world, small g? So there was a counterpart when God released that power for the church. When do you think you released that power? Thank you. Because there was an over, there was a power rising up that God already knew was happening. It was not so that we could look good. It was not so that we could speak in tongues. It was not so that we could uh, do this and do that and just go our merry way and then skip through the tulips and all that kind of stuff. It's because God knew that an opposition would rise up like it never risen up before because of the birth of the body of Christ, the birth of the church, endued with power to spread the gospel in the darkness and a hostility in a hostile land. So when God released, he knew the reason why he released that is because we are on a battle and in a battlefield. A war zone of the supernatural, of the spiritual realm. So therefore, what does it take to combat powers in high places and wickedness in high places? It takes a supernatural power in high places in us to combat exactly what we're fighting against. We don't fight, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Right. So when you look at that, step back a moment, and then you can see where I'm coming to you today. That's why no limitations to God's power in us when we serve Him, because that's what it's about. And when you look at Acts chapter 6 through, and I've lumped this together for a reason. When you look at Acts chapter 6 all the way through chapter 28 to the last verse, and do that. Take some time, God, with your family at home. It's chapter 6 of Acts all the way through chapter 28 of Acts. Look at that as the first day of Acts. And we're in the second day. And see what you see. You'll see a connection there about warfare, spiritual warfare. You'll see something that we have not really paid attention to unless, like we said earlier, many, many churches want to use a, a particular phrase, we're in spiritual warfare, but they don't know what spiritual warfare really is. Are there demons? Yes. Are there fallen angels? Yes. There are all those. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, when Jacob had run away from Esau, he had a dream, remember, about Jacob's ladder. And he dreamt that there, there was a ladder all the way from the, on the earth, all the way to the heavens. And he saw angelic beings come up and down all through the whole time. So what I'm trying to say is in today's world, there's an acceleration of supernatural warfare like we've never seen before. You say, well, how can this be happening? Because it, it's been declared it would happen. And that's why God wants the church to operate on all cylinders. Spirit, soul, and body. Why do you think that Jesus Christ in the book of Revelations goes to the churches and corrects them? 
Why do you think he goes to the church of Laodicea and tells them, he says, I'm fixing to spit you out because you're lukewarm. It's, it's, I told you before, when, when preachers take this particular scripture and say it is a scripture to invite for people to come up for salvation. No, it's not. This is the church. This is for people to understand that the church as a whole in this age has pretty much put Jesus outside of it. But he's still knocking at the door. Today, I want to remind you about the depth of the Word of God, how far it reaches. But I ask you to read chapters 6 of Acts all the way to, to the last chapter, 28. I want you to look at it, as I said, step back from the forest or from the trees so you can see the forest. And look at it, Sister Sidney. You'll see the picture that you see. You're going to see warfare, warfare, warfare. You're going to see the first thing that happened, Brother Kev. When he came out of the upper room, he saw, <coughs> excuse me, saw Peter come up there and preach a powerful message. He preached that message, speaking about Jesus Christ, speaking about repentance, speaking about uh, salvation, speaking about being baptized on down the line. Right? Then we see what happens after that. They go in chapter 2. I'm just kind of using these chapters to give you subtitles. They go to chapter 2, and at the very end, you see where they, <coughs> after they receive uh, the Lord, uh, 3,000 souls of 3,000 people were added to the church. They all go to the house churches, and they break bread together, and uh, they're just all excited about the apostles' teaching. Why is the apostles' teaching so important right there? Because they're the ones who walked hand in hand with Jesus Christ. So, man, they were eating up. You know, they were not saying, well, this is how we act. No, they were saying, they were saying first-hand knowledge, giving first-hand knowledge to those disciples. They were building on a solid foundation. And they were breaking bread and they were excited. That's why I told you, when they came out of that, they came out of that, that room after being touched uh, uh, by each other in, in faith and hearing the word of God, that's when Peter and John go out to the gate of beautiful, right? And what happened? They were overflowing with that, that corporate anointing. Not just Peter, not just John. They were a recipient of the corporate anointing because they'd been praying, breaking bread, lifting up Jesus' name. So when they come to the temple of God, the first thing they do is what is overflowing in them out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth spoken. And what was that that they had in their heart? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when they spoke that, that demon, that bondage, that crippling affair had nowhere to go but out of that man. Then we saw what happened, right? We saw the people got <clears throat> upset, the religious leaders and all the zealots of, of religion and all the uh, <clears throat> controllers, I call them. What did they do? They got, they got Peter and John. Because, you see, the it was not just hearsay anymore, Sister Flo. They had the actual, actual testimony with them. That this guy crippled, they all went into the house of God together. <clears throat> hmm? They see this happening. Throw him in jail. Threaten to beat him and tell him, don't preach in the name of Jesus. They come out and say, whether it be right or what you're saying or, or what God says, we're going to do what God says. In other words, they say, we have no alternative but to preach what we know in this Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so then what happens? Well, you see a perfect setup here. You see the power of God flowing. I mean, people added to the church. But then, look how it changes in the next chapter, subtitle. He started getting involved with church uh, schismatics, if you will. Ananias and Sapphira. What happened? Ananias and Sapphira came in the church. They sold it. Everybody was selling their possessions and, and giving them to the, the commentary of, of, the, of the apostles and such. <clears throat> Ananias and Sapphira. They come into church. This is the first breach in the church after a perfect church was born. Perfect pop. What happened? The people within. Then you had Simon the sorcerer. And then only to read these things. And what you'll see is all these things are now in his spiritual warfare. It is a supernatural. When Daniel, in his time, 
he was gifted and enabled to speak and communicate with the angel of God. <clears throat> Why? Because there is a spiritual realm that is more real around us than the physical things we touch. What I'm trying to show you is that God, the Word of God says that He has not given us the spirit of the world, but He has given us the spirit of the Lord, which we can discern the spiritual from the physical. But you have to be in that place to do that. Everything that I just shared with you, <clears throat> just the outpouring and paraphrasing on these concerns, you notice every one of them were in a position of serving the Lord. This home study, I hope that you take it to heart and read it and study it. Just take your time. Clean the nuggets for yourselves and see if what I'm saying is not true. Give a read. See if it's what we should walk in and why and what we can expect as the return of the Lord draws near. But I'm trying to get you to understand what they had going on at the beginning is going to intensify towards the ending. And what is that? Spiritual warfare. And a lot of people say, oh, <clears throat> he that is in me is greater than is in the world. I agree. Unless you serve in the flesh. I agree. But that's in the context of you serving God. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, this morning. I ask that you enable me, Father God, to speak the word directly and without any apologetics, Father God. <clears throat> speak it to the heart with love. Father God, as I always welcome everyone here, Lord God, I ask that each and every one of us truly come with one, one heart and one voice and one accord to lift up the name of Jesus and to boldly proclaim Jesus' testimony in our lives. When he said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let this be our testimony to his glory. Our text reading is found in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 14. And as I said earlier, the verse, key text verse, is verse 10. And I center on that, Brother Watcher, verse 10, because it houses, it's a canopy for everything I'm, I'm saying. It's not one thing in particular. And I want you to keep this key verse here connected to the remainder of the book of Acts and understand that the book of Acts is not closed. We are in the days of Acts. Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14, with our key text verse, verse 10, says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Did it stop there? No. It said what? And what? In the power of his might. Then it tells us what to do. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then the third thing he tells us to do is for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we see three things, or actually four things. First of all, he says in our key verse, finally, meaning having done all that you know to do. So <clears throat> the first thing is finally. You have to do everything that you know to do before you can do the second part, and that's to be strong in the Lord. So he's saying finally, after you've done all that you know to do, then, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he tells you what this does, what God will enable you to do when you have finally done all that you know to do. Because you resolve to stand firm in God's strength and his power. And then he tells you how you're protected. See, the armor of the Lord is not what we use to fight against wickedness. It's what we use to be protected from wickedness. The sword of the spirit is what we fight against the enemy with. 
which is the word of God. All right? But it says something else here in his power. So he's talking about in that place of, of the Holy Spirit empowering us to do something. So again, you have finally, meaning do, doing all that you know to do. My brother, be strong in the Lord, and the power is might. That is our key text. And then he tells you to put on the whole armor of God. So in other words, you can't put on the whole armor of God until you've done all that you know to do. And then you have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might in order to put on the whole armor of God. Let me ask you something. According to, to uh, Paul's um, thought process here, can you serve the world and serve God at the same time? Can you be protected from the world and put on the armor of God while you're in the world? It says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then the, the fourth thing, as I said, is it, it, excuse me, it declares and it clarifies who we actually fight against. It says spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we know that, and again, remember the word I told you at the beginning of the service, influencers. We know that the Holy Spirit influences and we know that the unholy spirit influences. So a lot of times what we have before us is the unholy and the holy. Holy is not doing everything perfect. Holy is being set apart unto God. Unholy is being set apart unto the world and Satan's works. So what I'm trying to say is this, when we stop believing that our battle is spiritual, then we've already lost. Because we fight our battles in the wrong places, with the wrong things. We start fighting against people and not against the powers of darkness. The only way that the power of darkness is changed is by the power of light. They say that the definition of darkness, there's no such thing as darkness. Is that right, Brother Watcher? Right. What is it? Absence of light. Absence of light. So what do you have in the world right now? Absence of light. What do we have, unfortunately, in many churches right now? Absence of light. Absence of light. Why? Because the word is not being preached. Why? Because people want to be accepted as they are. And I've heard that all the time. Oh, just come as you are and be accepted as you are. God already accepts us as we are. This is not about coming to church being accepted as you are. You're accepted, just period. The thing is this, that you don't have to have to do anything to uh, prove to me that, that uh, you're anything other than what you are. God already knows. You come to church to hear the word of God as you are, and I guarantee you if you come as you are, willing to hear what God says about how you are and what he wants you to be, then something's going to change. Amen. See, when I, came, when I first came to church, I was just coming out of the hospital. I'd just been drugged up. I was quoted, claimed, or I was declared a man depressive. Just gotten off of booze, all, everything. And I went to a church way over there in Baton Rouge, a little old corner, corner store church. And when I walked in there, something happened. I wish I could tell you that I have no more problems. I wish I could tell you that everything, all, I mean, the, the earth shook underneath me. Yes, it did. My skin crawled. Yes, it did. I fell on my face on my back. Yes, I did. But like so many others, when I got back up, I went right back into the world. Because you see, my heart had not been sold out, even though my mind agreed, but my heart still belonged to me. Come on. And as long as it still belongs to me, it's of no value to God, right. nor to anyone else. I've seen things in my life. And I'm sure most of you have in one form or another, but I've seen the other side of the, of the domain, so to speak, of the spiritual realm. I've seen darkness like you can't imagine. I've seen the wickedness, the darkness. I've seen witches. I've seen devils. I've seen all those things in my life. 
I've seen it operating in family members. I've seen the power of the darkness even cause a, a very clock on the wall to shatter. You say, oh, Pastor, you're exaggerating. No, I'm telling you the truth. I've seen the transference of spirit in the churches. And I don't mean good. So I know that the spiritual realm is just right here. While I'm speaking right now, there is a hovering. God's on my side. But the more I speak what I'm sharing with you right now, to those of you who are willing to listen right now, the more that I anger the very pits of hell, the flames of hell grow, and so does Satan's devils and demons. They, they get gnashing at the teeth. See, they, they want to make me believe that we are in a place in our lives where we're just like the seven sons of Sceva, where we go in there and we start telling in the name of Paul, in the name of Jesus, be gone, you. And those spirits are laughing and say, well, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but just who are you? So I want to ask you who you are. I want to ask you who you are, and then I want to tell you who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be a warrior for God. You're supposed to be God's love for people. You're supposed to be God's righteousness. Oh, Pastor, we can't even know our righteousness is as filthy rags, but we represent he that is in us that is greater than is in the world. Right. Everybody wants to talk about it, but when it comes to leaving tracks, when it comes to digging a hole, when it comes to making sure that people know who side you're on. I heard a preacher the other day was asked a point blank question, and he went around that, to answer that question so many different ways that when he's finished, he tired me out. He didn't say a word. Because he's afraid to be convicted or speaking the truth. Oh, y'all heard that, huh? That was just me taking a breath. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you have to be reminded about just what we're up against. You do only if you are in Him. And don't forget that. Don't any of you forget that. We say that we have the power of Christ. Yeah, when you're abiding in him and his word is abiding in you. No limitations to God's power in us, what? When, what? We serve him. I think today is this. When God equips there's nothing lacking except to stand and fight. Amen. When God equips, there's nothing lacking except to stand and fight. Church, if you notice the foundational readings that I did give you, uh, Acts and uh, naturally our text reading, it's all about Acts except for our text reading because I, I believe they go hand in hand. Why did they have power since you brought it up, Sister Sidney? Why did the apostles and the disciples of the first church have power? Why? What breed? Just because they, they look good? No, but what else? No, it's more than that. No, because the devils believe in Jesus too. Why did they have the power? Because of the hostility they would meet. That's why. Because of the opposition they would be. And that's what I, I want you to understand. They would not have any opposition if you didn't cause, you weren't a threat to them. That's what I want you to believe. If you weren't a threat to the powers of darkness, there would be no need for the Holy Spirit in your life. Because as soon as you were born again, boom, you'd be gone. But you have a battle to fight. Oh, I know the battle belongs to the Lord. When are you willing to go down the battlefield? When the Lord God becomes... Jehovah's, what, Nisi, your banner. That's what I'm trying to get you to believe right now. I'm not undermining what God has blessed us with by grace through faith, but I'm just telling you and I right now that that in itself, put in a shelf and in a closet, is no better than just saying, I believe in God and go out and get drunk and fornicate and everything else. The Bible world says in the book of James that you believe in God, you do well. 
so do the demons, but they fear and tremble. Brothers and sisters, we don't make anything in the Word of God a past lesson to be read and closed. It's about other believers and what they went through. It's about calling us aggressively by the power of the Word of God to stand against the darkness in power, fully equipped. Because the book of Acts introduces to the church the real battle of spiritual warfare. But it's in three battlefields. Spirit, soul, and body in that order. And why? Why? Because we are spiritual beings, either of darkness or of light. And that's still the same reason today for the empowering of the Lord's church today. It's with spiritual gifts and supernatural authority over all the power of the enemy. Does the word not say in Luke chapter 11, excuse me, Luke chapter 10 verses 19 through 20. It says that Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power. That is Luke 10, 19 through 20. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Why did he give them power then? Because of the opposition. They needed power because they were in a hostile land. And they were bringing forth something. What were they bringing forth? The gospel of what? The light. So anytime you bring something that will shatter the control of an opposition, then they will come against you with everything they have. I have a, I told you about my compact bow, right? Oh man, I love the rascal, muscle memory and all that stuff. How many of you know that muscle memory is, is needed, right, Sister Brooklyn? But how many of you know that um, perseverance is needed too? Because after a couple of hours, your body, no matter how much muscle memory you have, your body remembers that you're tired. <laughs> you need to put it away for a moment. Well, right now, what I'm trying to get you to understand is the weaponry that God has given us, you're never to put away, but you are to hone and make excellent. You are to exercise it. You are to see the need for it. Now, Jesus Christ, if all we needed to know was that the power in us is greater than it's in the world, then why did he give the gifts to the church, to all, I mean, to every one of us? Because the body of Christ needs the gifts. Do you think, Sister Sidney, that there's no more use for the gifts? How about you, Sister Victoria? More than ever. How about you, Brother Kev? See, a lot of people say there's no more need for the gifts because we're, we're perfected now. <laughs> really? We need the gifts more now than ever. We need them operating. And what I want you to hear is the gifts were not just given to the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry has a different, different gifts given to them. Hear me well. The gifts given to the fivefold ministry are administrative gifts for teaching and, and whatever. Those, those are for the fivefold ministry. Administrative gifts. The word of God says in Ephesians that Jesus gave gifts to men. Okay? That's the fivefold ministry. Not all the fivefold ministry gifts are upon the body of Christ, but all the gifts of the body of Christ are upon the, all the body, whether you be fivefold or not. You follow what I'm saying? There is a reason for this. And yet the fivefold ministry is not a headship of its, its own. It is underneath the, the head of Christ, who is Jesus. I mean, the head of the church, whom is Jesus. Remember what we talked about earlier? What am I saying? What's the problem with the government? You see any checks and balances there? What's the problem with the media? You see any checks and balances there? What do you think that God intended to institute in the body of Christ to keep the church functioning as a whole, a healthy, whole deity, so to speak? It's called checks and balances. No one thing has more power than the other, yet all is needed. The, the very power source is none other than Jesus Christ, who's the head of the church. 
That's why we need all the gifts. That's why we need the full armor of God. That's why we need to see clearly our enemy. That's why Jesus Christ, when he said to his apostles, he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. You understand that as demons. I don't know of any scorpion that I, I want to, to put on my pillow. Or a serpent that I'd want in my bed. Because they are deadly. And that's what he was referring to. Now Jesus was with them, yet he gave them as a type and shout, if you will, a dress rehearsal of what they would be having to walk in in his absence. But with the same power flowing through them. The power of the Holy Spirit. And the thing I want you to hear is the power flows when we serve God. I don't mean, uh, you know, oh, you got everything. I mean when we bring that word to the to the streets, when we bring that word to the church, when we bring that word to our neighbors, when we bring that word to our family. You, you need power, not to stomp on them, but to endure <clears throat> and to keep on bringing it in truth and love. Our young people, you think that they, they want to hear what I'm talking about today? No. But you know what? Neither do a lot of other folks that are not young. You know why? Because they say, oh, yeah, but wait a minute. You're, you're talking about we got to do something. Yeah, we do. we got to surrender to God. Yeah, we do. we got to submit to God and resist the devil. You can't do that in your own strength. Everywhere you turn, everywhere I turn, whether it be in the church or on the streets, when you leave here, the very words that I spoke to you, you're going to be tested on. He said that nothing by shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not, for the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Church, this is why we need to, the constant infilling of the Holy Spirit. Darkness and light will always clash until. Just like there will always be a battle between God's people and the Amalekites. Amalek. Which speaks about the flesh, our old nature. As long as we're in this body, we will always battle. You will always battle against fleshly tendencies. That's the Amalekite in your life. It's not the world back then. It was the pagans around them. But our world, this body that we, we are housed in, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But this body still has a tendency to be pagan. It still wants to serve the world. By our own gratitude, by our own desires that are ungodly. See, this is what you have to understand that the paralleling of the Old Testament and the New is not diminishing one, it's accenting the other in a spiritual realm. And that's what I'm getting, trying to get you to understand. It's not to shout you down, not to make you feel ignorant. It's trying to open up your understanding so that you can see in the real world. The real world is not this chair that I sit in. This real world is not the core that I get in. This real world is what is surrounding me. That's what's surrounding me. And let me tell you something. For every truth that I speak to you today, you have a lying spirit on your shoulder that says, ah, you don't have to believe all that. But my witness is not in myself. My witness is the word of God, which you can read for yourself. That's why I asked you, is there still any need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit today? Yes. More so. Why? 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 Pastor, you said it. Look at all we have going for it. Because of that. Because we're so close, my brothers and sisters. We are so close, whenever that may be. Whether we leave this earth, you know, meet the Lord, or whether he comes to take us, we're closer than we've ever been. You can have the best life you ever thought possible today if you're in Christ Jesus. That's when you can say, he that is in me is greatest in the world. Why could you put your trust in him? Anybody hear me? Yeah. It's just like it was when I was just talking about the Amalekites. Do you understand the parallel? And that's your old flesh. When you're arrogant, so when we say, ah, 
I don't have to do that. I'm saved by grace through faith. I'll just live like I want. When that time comes, I'll get right off. Hey, listen, God knows I'm just human. All that kind of stuff we do, you know. You can't tell God anything he doesn't already know. And yet he still loves us. And that's the biggest thing I say, Lord, God, how can you? He said to me, he says, I'm the only one who can. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for that. Because he is. He's the only one who can love me in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And still see the good at the end of the trip. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm sharing with you, what I'm sharing. I see the good, the bad, and the ugly because I see a mirror image of myself. But I also see the good at the end of the trip because that's my faith. My faith is what God started in each and every one of us. And my confidence rides on the fact that what, what he started in us, I'm confident that he will complete. Will it be bumpy? Oh, yeah. Will you fall on your face? Oh, yeah. But you're going to get up. You're going to keep getting up until it's a done thing. You know why? Because it's not you who's doing it. It's him that is doing it in you. If you look to him, trust in him, and fight the good fight of faith, I promise you, you will come out victorious, no matter what it is. In Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, it says this, brothers and sisters, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. Now this came, he, Amalek came when they were going to the promised land. Speaks about us. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, listen, Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now each one of those names speaks volumes to what they were called to do. Moses' name came from being a water bearer. Okay, word. Okay. What about her? Ooh, what was her represent? Her represents purity. So what does Aaron represent? Priesthood, pure priesthood, bringing the word. What held up Moses' hands? A pure priesthood. What are we called to be? A pure priesthood under God, the Lord Jesus. Is that not true? Yeah. We're supposed to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. It says this, so Joshua did as Moses had said, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass that Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. It's kind of like God. When we put the word of God before us and we follow the word of God, we prevail. But when you don't, your flesh prevails, right? right. Moses, well, Pastor, uh, that, that's Moses. Well, hey, listen, Moses don't worship better than we are, right? So the same thing that applied to him applies to us. All those people in the battlefield, they were winning as long as Moses' hand was up, uh, the staff was up. It was not about Moses. It's about the word of God, about who he represented. That's why I told you, no limitations to God's power in us when we serve him. It says here, and Amalek prevailed, and Moses' hands were heavy. You ever get tired? Anybody in here ever get tired? Let me ask you something. You ever been kind of worn out or burn out sometimes? You feel like you burn out. And you start, you know, you love the Lord. It's not about you not loving the Lord. It's about you stirring up that fire, keeping that, that hunger and thirst going, making sure that when you get in prayer, it's not ritualistic, and that you really, you, you, you got to turn it up. You gotta fight. Sometimes you gotta beat on the floor because your prayers, you feel like they're, they're hitting that, that brass curtain. But you gotta fight for it. Effectively and fervently, you gotta fight for it like Isaiah did. Excuse me, like Elijah did. See, nothing comes easy when you're in a hostile world. But it does come because it's on our side. It says here. And Joshua discomforted, or he uh, routed, or, or just overcame the Amalekites and his people with the edge of the sword. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, and the Lord said unto Moses, not her, not Aaron, not Joshua, but who? And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, meaning banner, meaning covering, meaning my miracle. For he said, because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Our miracle, our banner, our righteousness, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sin Canoe, are all rolled up in the name and the authority and the power that we walk in today. When you read the book of Acts, what do you see happening and why? Now you should be hearing people answer. You see warfare, spiritual warfare. When I read the book of Acts, I see exactly that. But I also see the awesome power that the Holy Spirit brought to empower the church. But with that, I see the reason for it. I see the obvious reason, the more realistic reason, the obvious core of the truth. It's about spiritual warfare. It's about the ongoing warfare today. The book of Acts is not just the birth and empowering of the church. It's not just about evangelism. It's not just about the supernatural empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's also about warfare. A designated battleground in the spirit, in the soul, and in the flesh. Individually, collectively, and cooperatively. In the daily life of true followers of Jesus Christ. Because we are now children of light. But even more intensified as each day is passing. Jesus in the Gospels preached, taught the kingdom of God. He spoke about salvation and repentance and dealt with demons and all manner of sicknesses and diseases. And when he completed that which he came do, to do, he said it is finished. But then he passed on his mantle to the church. Didn't he? Brother Jeff, didn't he? Didn't, doesn't that kind of sound familiar? Like what Elijah did to Elisha? What was the keynote for Elisha receiving the mantle when he saw him take it up? Well, let me ask you, did the apostles and the disciples see Jesus take it up in a cloud? Yes. yes, they did. Wow. So the mantle spiritually was passed to us as well. He said, you will do even greater things. Not greater in quality, but quantity. Church and disciples, the Lord saw Jesus when he was taken up in the cloud. It is, to me, is so clear that I look for that. I look for clarity in Scripture. And I, I hope to share that with y'all, to broaden your scope of understanding and to show them you the privilege and the opportunity we have. I mean, listen, it's unlimited, unlimited. Oh, man, there's no limitations, Brother Roger. Miss Christine, there's no limitations in your life. I'm not picking at you. I just do that with everybody. I want to involve you. I want to involve everyone. Sister Brooklyn, don't, don't limit God. Well, you see, I don't know if I know God. There's no better time to know him than right now. Brothers and sisters, this happened in a world that was filled with nothing but hostility. Why wouldn't you think that what we need today is the same thing because of the same situations and circumstances except more intense hostility everywhere you turn? You can't even speak the word of God boldly, publicly, without someone taking offense and you being oppressed because you spoke boldly, not to that person, but in general. You know, at first it seemed, when the church first birthed forth, it says, and, and they had favor with all men. That's until they stepped out of the church. We have favor with everybody once we, when we're all together, brother, brother Brian. But it's when we step outside of the church, when we're so filled with the, the Jesus, the salvation, that it overflows, that out of your mouth, Nothing but what's filling your heart comes forth. 
by the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And then he said, he said, for us to to speak the word. And then when the Holy Spirit starts really bringing conviction, because it's the Holy Spirit. It's not you that brings conviction, it's the Holy Spirit. They were repenting and they were being baptized in the authority of Jesus' name in the name of the Father and in the Son of the Holy Spirit. Then things started to shape. Why? Because the whole world, the world, the hostility of the world was, was shaking off this foundation because something greater was happening. The kingdom of light and, and the power of God's righteousness and freedom was in full-blown opposition and came out full force against in every direction, spirit, soul, and body. Why? Because the enemy does one thing, steal, kill, and destroy. Why? Because Jesus Christ came to give us life and life more abundantly. That's what the apostles were doing. No, brothers and sisters, I don't see the book of Acts as just a place of empowering so that we can say I'm blessed and highly favored. I see the reason for empowering because of the battlefield of life then and now, spiritual warfare. No, brothers and sisters, I don't see revival in the book of Acts. I see the birthing forth of the body of Christ with a, with a now power to grow and mature and spread the gospel to the lost and the dying world and to a compromised church. No, brothers and sisters, I don't see a once and done evangelistic spreading of the gospel. I see the battlefield of darkness and light being fought. I see today as I do then for the same reason, to equip the body of Christ for spiritual warfare until the Lord of hosts, till the Lord of lords, until the Lion of Judah returns with a sword in his mouth and the word of truth and destroys once and for all the lies of hath God said with yes he has said. Revelation 19, 11 through 17 says exactly those words. My goal today, as I come to the close of this message, is to help us see the forest through the trees about the book of Acts in a greater depth and a broader picture. The book of Acts speaks of ongoing battle in which you and I are engaged to fight. Yes, we all say it and it is true. The battle doesn't belong to the Lord. The battle is not ours. But the battle is the Lord's when we're in the presence of the Lord. And Jehoshaphat, when he made league with the world and repented, and he sought the Lord with all of his heart and brought the church or brought the people of God to that place of worship, it says the whole family, the elders, the young, the medium, all down the line, and they worshiped, they fell on their faces and worshiped God. That the prophet of God came unto them and said, the Lord God said, this battle is not yours, it's mine. Why? Because they once more put Jesus, put the Lord God in the center, and they worshiped him. I have a declaration to make to you today. We are in a war. In today's culture, today's times and world platforms, many scoff at the idea of Satan and spiritual warfare. Yet many years before, Keith Green spoke of that truth we see today. Brothers and sisters, if we choose to ignore or not believe in the spiritual realm or put le lesser emphasis on that which we can't see, let me ask you, how then can we walk by faith and not by sight? The church as a whole falls into four major categories. Worldly, religious, apostate, and holy unto God. Word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Amplified, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Church, as time goes on, 
If we're not careful, it's easy to find ourselves confused, frustrated, and quenching the peace that God has promised to each of us. The best defense is to live in the reality of who you are and who you're not. There is an ongoing contrast, and that contrast is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 10. You can read it at home. That ongoing contrast is the contrast that of light and that of darkness that will be supernatural and will be mistaken for anything other than God's presence. Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2 says this, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Brothers and sisters, as I mentioned earlier, Daniel chapter 10, verses 7 through 17, chapter 10, 7 through 17, you'll see things that have happened to men of God and women of God. Daniel, you'll see all, oh, so many of them, uh, women too, uh, you know, uh, Sarah and, and Moses and many of these things, they speak out about what we can't see, but it's definitely there, just like Daniel spoke about, just like uh, in the book of Acts, you know, just like Jacob and Jacob's ladder. I mean, you could go on and on. But what I want you to understand is that spiritual realm that God wants us to tap into is to let us know that we can bridge a gap between the physical and the spiritual realm. God allowed these men to bridge the gap in the physical realm to see it in the spiritual realm. For instance, Elisha that we just talked about. The Lord opened up the eyes of Elisha's servant to see the host of God's army. When the enemy had surrounded, had surrounded, and said, you find that, brothers and sisters, and you want to read that 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 17. He opened the eyes of Elisha's servant to see the spiritual army of God's army around those who surrounded them. And Daniel saw the angels standing before him, and everyone else left and felt, and felt the terror and fled the scene. But Daniel was granted access to see and hear and speak spiritually as he could communicate with the angel. These examples clearly demonstrate the workings of invisible spiritual realm around us. Church, now is the time by grace of Christ to cultivate spiritual perspectives. And spiritual maturity that will serve as biblical defenses to spiritual attacks. Brothers and sisters, when I look at people that I've admired through the years that have gone home to be with the Lord, one is Keith Green. When he spoke, he said, at one time, we were all aware of Satan. He said, but now we don't believe in Satan, and Satan laughs. In other words, he said, at one time we were all aware of the spiritual domain that is against people that are, are striving to live unto God. But in today's time, we no longer see that. Today's time, the church no longer talks about that. Now, I'm not here to tell you there's a demon underneath every rock. But I'm here to tell you that whatever your path is, there's a demon waiting. There's a, a, an influence waiting to cause you to get off of your path. But I want to tell you, no matter what you face, and no matter what I face, when you live in the reality of who we are, you will always find that there's more on your side and more protecting you than that which is against you. Amen. Church, I'm talking to each of us. I'm talking to those who belong to Christ. I'm talking to those who are not sure. I'm talking to those who have compromised and who have backslidden. I'm talking to the world. 
To those of us who belong to the Lord, we must follow in the footsteps of Christ. We must commit to honor and glorify the Lord regardless of what adversity comes and what personal sacrifices must be made. Though Satan may win some skirmishes, and he does, skirmishes, the battle belongs to the Lord when we seek the Lord. And as countless others throughout the Bible have done and known, so churches the days and fold continue to trust in his good plans for you and I. Continue to trust in his sovereignty. Continue to ask the Lord God to open your eyes to see the spiritual warfare that is contending against you who's, and who's on your side surrounding you. And recognize that even though Satan is powerful and active, and he is, is already a defeated foe. Amen. When you seek the Lord with all your heart and put on that armor of life provided by the Lord Jesus, the Christ, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, you will hear no one else say it, but you will hear him say it. The battle belongs to the Lord. Father God, there are no limitations of your power in our lives to equip us. We are in the days of Acts. We are in a place of hostility. But Lord God, we are abiding in you and you're abiding in us. Lord God, he that is in us is greater than us in the world when we serve you. Father, I thank you right now, Lord, that there is a shaking under my feet. There is a shaking under people's feet right now, whether they believe it or not. God will have the last word. And God said, before the day was, I am. In the name of Jesus, I say amen. And everybody says, amen. let you give God all the glory.